So uh, it's important for us to always reimagine or rethink the way we look at violence, right? Um, from the way we watch action movies or the way we're always swallowing uh, what's going on in the news, we constantly identify the violence equation as perpetrator and victim. Uh, once the movie ends, though, or it's time for the next thing in the newsreel, uh, our relationship to the violent act usually kind of ends there. And obviously just having one conversation about the intersection between masculinity and violence isn't enough. Um, but today, we're looking to deepen that conversation. So today on the show, we've got Yuval Moses. Thank you for being here. Um, and Yuval works at the Crime Victims Treatment Center here in New York. So CVTC is the Crime Victims Treatment Center. We're an organization in New York um, that provides free psychotherapy and other services as well that I can talk about um, for anybody who's been a victim of a violent crime. Um, our services are free of charge, which is really important. Um, we don't charge insurance, um, and people can just sort of come in and get what they need. Um, we don't look at immigrant um, immigration status or anything like that. Um, the only the only requirement is to have um, survived a violent crime um, throughout your 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 life. So wow. we see people who have just been um, uh, assaulted and people who have histories, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years back. This may be a stupid question, but how do you kind of vet that, or how do you? We don't. Okay, just trust them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's if, fair. if you come in and say that, that, <laughs> that you're suffering from trauma because of a fair. violent crime, that's all, that's all we need. Thank you for your work. <laughs> <laughs> kind of why we're here on the show talking about uh, CVTC and your work there. Do you think there's a part of masculinity, specifically, uh, and good or bad, that has influenced why you were there? Uh, so, I mean, yeah. I'm a psychotherapist, I'm a clinical social worker. Um, so I, I do psychotherapy. And I worked in a couple of agencies and most of the, the clients that we see are female clients who come in. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But, but one of the things that's personally important to me is that men are also um, get the services that they need and one of the things that I that that I uh, do at CVTC is run a men's group and sort of a lot of my clients 50 60 sometimes 70 percent of my clients are, are male clients so really um, having more exposure and more services for men um, to get us on the same page first and foremost what exactly are we identifying as violent crime I think I was trying to think about that um, I think any force used to control another person um, without them wanting that. Um, and when I say force, I think often physical force. Uh, I mean, that's the, the easy one, um, but also emotional force um, or uh, controlling. Um, for example, in uh, intimate partner violence. So, like, I have a question about that, right? Yeah. So, um, in terms of masculinity with men do you find that that's something that comes into the the conversation or like something that you see or is it i mean like how do you how do you do you interact with that yeah well i think first of all there are a lot of barriers for men to get services some of them are society barriers where it just you know, not as common for people to look for for men to a acknowledge that they need the help and b be able to to um, to go and say they need the help and and talk to someone. The second thing is that there just aren't many services uh, for for men out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had many many experiences of clients coming in and sort of saying, I have been trying to get the help for a while, but wherever I go, they say we don't serve men. Mm. Um, so I mean, in terms of the masculinity part of it. Uh, that is another barrier, I think, often for, for many men. Uh, because we're sitting in a room, it's two people, there's a lot of intimacy, right? It's, it's a professional setting, right? But there's a lot of intimacy when you're sitting with a therapist and, and talking about... Um, it's a lot of vulnerability. In yeah, there, a lot yeah. of vulnerability, right? And, and men are not really nope. um, conditioned for that. 
Um, and I have my own, right? Like, I'm also a man. So it's two men sitting in, in a room, which is definitely not an experience <laughs> that, right? Yeah. Like, sitting, in, we, we, we don't have huge offices. We're a non for profit. So our mm-hmm. offices are not huge. So it's in pretty close proximity. Cozy. Looking, yeah, right? Looking, <laughs> maintaining eye contact for 45, 50 minutes. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot, right? Yeah. It's a lot for anyone. But if you add masculinity into the mix and, um, the experiences that we have as men growing up, uh, it, it makes it harder. So th- I think there's an extra barrier um, for men often to have uh, to get the services that they need. So, I mean, I'm kind of going all over here, but I just want to know, like, for you, that experience, like, saying you haven't really, that this was kind of like the first experience that you had, like, dealing with men on that kind of level, on like, so often. Um, what was that experience like for you in the beginning? So I, I've worked with Ben before. I've been working with men throughout my whole career. Mm. Um, and here at the at the Crime Victims Treatment Center, I, I work mostly with men. And I run the group for male survivors of childhood sexual abuse, which is I think is really important to say. Mm-hmm. Um, what is my experience? It's complex, which is this, the clinical social worker answer to everything. It's <laughs> complex or it depends. I've had to identify m- my own uh, feelings about masculinity and to sort of understand what my masculinity is. Um, I and I and this is a very sort of like my perspective, right? I and it's the only perspective that I can talk from, obviously. Um, but I, I grew up in Israel, I, which is a very different society than than the American society. I. Um, I was in the military for four years. It's mandatory there. I was an officer, um, and and that and sort of that experience is very the, the Israeli machismo is very different <laughs> than the than the American one. Right. Huh. Um, the, the masculinity is viewed in a very different way. Um, I actually found it uh, freeing to come to New York, and in that sense, because it felt like more of a masculinity that I could encompass or uh, was like this kind of masculinity, right. whatever that is. Yeah, so co- for me coming to New York was, was nice to be able to sort of redefine that for myself mm-hmm. and find, find my, my own experience in it, which feels the New York masculinity feels a little more gentle to me. Mm-hmm. Um, in many ways, I think it allows for, uh, for a little more of a diversity in the experience. Yeah. Cool. So one of the things that you said uh, is you, you mentioned something about, um, you know, victims and perpetrators, actually, a little bit. I think maybe before you said the podcast, so I kind of wanted to highlight that a little bit and to talk about, like, the link between victims and or survivors and perpetrators in the work that you do. Um, just in the is there is there a connection between somebody who is a a perpetrator of violence and somebody who is, who has been a, a, do the, are those people many times survivors as well? Yes. So, so the, the, the simple question is, yes, there is a connection. Mm -hmm. Um, but of, of course it's very complex. And I was thinking about what, what is this connection and how do I sort of understand it? And I think the first thing to say, and this is going a little backwards, but it's important to say, I think Mm -hmm. that, that, when we experience trauma, when we experience a threat um, like violence, um, we have a natural response to it, right? What we all know is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and the D, that disorder part, is um, misleading, and I think we need to, to let it go because it's post-traumatic stress, and, and it's not a disorder. It's actually our body's way, our, our mind's way, our organism's way to protect itself in the best way that it can. So it's a really natural response to a threat to the body, to our life, to our loved ones. Mm. And I think it's really important to say that. Mm. Um, what I think my experience is working in this field is the people that we often see, men and women, who come in to, to get therapy are those who had the natural response of PTS, of traumatic stress, um, and weren't tended to when it happened. So it's not necessarily the, the crime itself, 
um, that set them up to later on need the help, um, but it's the, the not being tended to. Uh, and I can say more about that, but what is the connection between survivor and perpetrator or victim and perpetrator? I think that when you are not tended to after having experienced a horrible threat to your life or something of that nature, um, one of the things that happens is that, they, that you have all this anger or um, hurt or uh, just all these experiences that are very painful. If there's someone out there that's able to be there with you and sort of help you process it, then, then you can go back to sort of this normal functioning. But when that doesn't happen, you're left with all this really strong emotion. Then what do you do with it? And then some people sort of bring it to themselves and, and self-harm or, or mm -hmm. self-sabotage. Um, and for others, um, it goes outside, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and so that, I think, is a more complex way of looking at it, right? It, there's a lot of anger that's left, or not just anger, and then hurt, hurt, hurt yeah. um, hypervigilance, like mm -hmm. understanding that the world is not a safe place and that you have to, to, to make it, right? A sa safe for you, whatever that means, yeah. right? And I think that that might be a link to why sometimes someone who is a victim also becomes a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to piggyback there a little bit. So when it comes to masculinity, and maybe it's more American masculinity uh, than it is New York mas masculinity, but I almost find it that there's like these these kind of tropes or embeds within masculinity that would be almost. Um, opposed to this kind of thinking, whether it's like sensitive, like sensitivity, thoughtfulness, even science, correct? Like there could be opposition to like these ideas of even the word or the acronym PTS, right? And what stress is, that? that's not even a thing, that's whatever. And mm -hmm. I guess, do you encounter that daily or regularly? And what is your strategy, I guess? Yeah, I think, I think what, what you're talking about is like a yeah, absolutely. I, I see it all the time. I, and and part of it is, I think, just denial. I think it's it's really, it, it's an expectation from men, definitely. And I think it's just for us as a society to sort of uh, look at emotions often as something that we want to get rid of or control or as just like a, a byproduct or a side effect of right. being human. Um, and definitely for men, I think that that is... Um, the experience growing up, right? Like, buck up, you know, be a man. Don't, don't like suppress. Yeah, suppress. Don't feel. Uh, don't cry. Um, toughen up. All of those um, experiences of our experiences of don't feel your emotions. Um, so, so yeah, we see it all the time. What do we do when someone comes in to get therapy, help for 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 trauma? Um, we focus on the emotions. I mean, one of the biggest experiences of of being a survivor, being a victim of uh, of a crime is that the emotions become overbearing. Mm -hmm. um, and so people try to disconnect from them. Mm -hmm. um, it's good, it's, it's protective. So it's really important that it happens because in the moment that is the only way to survive. However, you can't keep not being in touch with those emotions or with those experiences because then you, you're sort of stuck there for the rest of your time right um, and that's when people come in and, and come to process those traumas with us um, so together with another person uh, y you can deal with those experiences and sort of uh, set yourself free I don't like that language but right. you get what I mean I really stuck on what you said about disorder and and how like because the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is how it just kind of absconds us of 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 responsibility to support one another in our time of need. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that before it escapes me because all of this has to do with our lack of ability to want to to actually pu like purely connect to one another on a human level and um, like. I feel like in your work you get to see the the real impact of that like the real impact of of years of neglecting somebody and what they've gone through you know it's cool because I, I think we what i'm seeing you saying is a lot of times myself included uh 
we employ the the act of denial, mm-hmm. and and it and it's almost a cultural thing to employ the act of denial. We lack honesty, whether it's self honesty or public honesty, and we we insulate ourselves in denial. And it's cool that there's a, there is a place in a situation um, where people who have gone through severe acts of violence, who've been victims of severe acts of violence, can find a safe place to start of removing right those levels or layers of denial yeah, yeah. I, and i i mean it's important for me to say that and i said it but i'll say it again that I, I look at denial with a lot of respect um it it's there for a reason uh mm. it, mm. it's it's protect i mean it's called a defense mechanism right mm-hmm, but it's pr- mm-hmm. but it's protective because if 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 you are a victim of childhood sexual abuse you were five, six, seven years old when this happened to you, right? If you had to live your, the rest of your life with the feelings that you had back then, you would not be able to function. So denying that anything happened or denying mm. that there were any feelings mm-hmm. or, or, or mm-hmm. sort of manipulating the story in your mind to say, you know, it's my fault, right? Makes a lot of sense, mm. especially wow. when there isn't someone on the other side yeah. to say, it's not your fault and, and to respond and to protect you when you need the protection. Yeah. Right. And so that's it's so it's so so important to to know that 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 it's natural and that it makes sense. And that with a safe other in a professional sort of setting, um, you it can be um, worked through. Damn. That's deep. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pause. <Woo. laughs> Um, so masculinity it comes with these tropes. I think we've 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 already started to get there. Um, but it's the bro, it's the macho, it's the pull yourself up by your bootstraps and ignore your emotions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what happens when men are the victims and survivors of violent crime? How how does masculinity still survive in that room, or how does masculinity still survive post trauma of that nature? Um, I think suffering has a lot to do with it. Oh, let's talk about right. that. Let's I expand mean, there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at, if, if you're denying, if you are hurting inside, but but putting it, suppressing it, and saying like it doesn't matter, I'll just man up and and do what I need to do. Um, you're probably carrying an immense amount of pain and are not tending to it. And one of the things that we know through research and also just through our own experiences um, is that when we don't tend to these emotions, um, they tend to get bigger. They don't just go away. No. They don't. Like, it's not, it's not how we work. Um, so I think often what happens is there is uh, somewhat of a breaking point, right, where, where things are not going right, where relationships are... are are just not coming to fruition, where uh, jobs, you know, blow up, um, and and then people seek help. Um, I think the 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 level of discomfort has to be higher for men um, in mm-hmm. order to the threshold. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, is higher for men to go seek help because there is uh, a, a a bigger uh, experience of shame. How do we, what do we do with it when people come in? We deal with it, right? We talk about it. That, that's psychotherapy. <laughs> um, but like, but, but I mean that in, in the profound sort of way or the deep way of like, we'll talk about it. What is it like that you are a man and that you're coming here, right? If that is, not every man has that issue, right? right? There are often men who do not feel like it is um, a breach of their masculinity to come in for therapy. Mm. But for those who do feel that, that it is, then if it becomes an issue, then we'll talk about it. So the National Institute of Justice uh, has surveyed violent crime in the past, and it, I think this is important and imperative for us to know and consider. It shows that boys and men are more likely to be the victims of assault, robbery, and homicide, more so than girls or women are. Uh, that's something we see on the regular. It's something we we almost know. Like if I watch a movie, nine times out of ten, this type of violent crime is going to happen to a man. Right. But when I see the news, I see it's between men, or it's per- the the men are the victims. But the conversation doesn't go further than that. Like mm-hmm. it, the scene ends there. How do we begin to honestly think as a culture of men as victims, or men can be victims? Well, I, I mean, I'm here. It's because this is really important. We need to have conversations about it. We need to, to, 
one of the things that we have at the Crime Victims Treatment Center, if you look at our website, is that we have tailored services for men, right? So if someone goes on our website and, and uh, looks for services and they are a man, then there's a tab that they can press that says services for men. Uh, it sounds silly, maybe, but if you go anywhere else, it's not there. Um, the, and most of the, the most social workers are females. Um, and I think that it's a profession that, I mean, there's the standard, there's a social standards of like men don't really look for therapy, but also I think a lot of the services are tailored for women. Um, and it's they a, are. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think a lot of it is because women uh, dominate the, the, this, um, this profession. And I'm not saying it as a judgment. I'm just looking at it as like an observation where there aren't services, not enough services for men. Um, so how do we do it? We, wear, we raise awareness. We talk to kids in school um, when, when they get sex ed, not just about... Right, like oh mind god. blown. Mind that is blown. what I've been saying. Oh my god! Yeah. Right, but not just yeah. about like whatever wet dreams and and condoms and <laughs> masturbation. Yeah. That is sort of like you know, if you're lucky, people talk to you about that. But we talk also about like what is what is sexuality and 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 masculinity and how to be safe and how to be um, how to think about your identity. But I mean, that would be great. That would be wonderful, <laughs> right? I mean, I I just. I, I have to, like, everything you're saying is so wonderful, and, like, especially the work, um, I mean, like, how gender-based violence is always about women being victims of violence or survivors of violence, and it's, like, it's disproportionate, I know, on some levels, right? But, I mean, when we talk about the proportions, first of all, we have to say that it's not based on reality because most of it goes unreported. So it's like, and I was reading this thing actually that was saying that, you know, even if a man is, you know, if, if men who are victims, like you were saying, of, of violence are much, much less likely to say something about it. It's just, there's, there's a dehumanizing. I'm always going, gonna go back to the human thing because it's like just a dehumanizing of men in this area, just like there's a dehumanizing of women in other areas, right? Like. It's like you don't deserve compassion mm -hmm. or love or support because you're supposed to be strong. And like, that's cr that you're not a lion. You know what I mean? Like you're a person. So it's right. like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe lions also need to have that compassion. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to throw shade at the lions Maybe right when now, we retire, we start a uh, service for lions <laughs> who need some <laughs> compassion. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, it's like, I just, I, I mean, I just wanted to bring that up because it's just like, that that's what it is. It's like, it's its a gender, genderized, like who gets compassion, who gets love, who gets support, and then it's like, on the other side, it's like, you know, who gets money, who gets fame, who gets power, who gets um, to be absconded from accountability, like we were talking about recently, about like the R. Kelly's and the OJ's and the Donald Trump's, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so I think compassion and receiving compassion and giving compassion is a really important part here, mm -hmm. um, and and which is really hard for men to be on the receiving side. Maybe even harder than being on the on the giving side of it. Um, I think receiving compassion and uh, I don't know warmth or support. Um, is really difficult for men because in a, in a way it validates an experience of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wanna say vulnerability and weakness are different things, oh right? Oh God, yes. Um, I was just gonna say vulnerability is power. It, it is, mm -hmm. right? It, it, uh, accepting one's vulnerability is power. Yes. Um, and weakness is a different thing. Often survivors uh, mix those two up. Um, Many people mix those two up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but if I'm thinking about the the experience of, of compassion, when I was talking before about the response that we give to survivors of, of of violence or of crimes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And right, if if you imagine someone coming to you um, and saying, you know, this horrible thing just happened to me, um, I think for most people the instinct is 
to s because it is such a strong experience to, to hear uh, a story of a violent crime that people sort of um, close up, right? They might say like, I'm sorry, or like, it's horrible, um, but it won't go much past that often. No. Um, and I think, especially when it comes to men, um, there is less compassion, there is less openness to seeing vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and that often society, parents, um, uh, friends, whoever's around, don't respond. And not because they're mean or they want to harm the person, but they just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And it feels so overwhelming that the experience is just like, well, sorry it happened to you and like stop crying uh, in, in, in one right. way or another. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you're lucky to get the sorry that it happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot, of, a lot of what we do at CVTC, right, is compassion and sort of working on, I mean, at this point for us, I think it's, it's easy to give the compassion, um, but working with people who come in to learn to accept it. And I think for men, it's often harder. Mm -hmm. no, I think it's powerful because we've been talking recently on the podcast about how a lot of times women are looked at as subhuman in certain elements of society and some uh, elements of just everyday interaction. But it's interesting that you point out that almost in this instance of men receiving compassion or allowing them to be vulnerable, if they were to, it's almost seen as they are subhuman in that equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a profound way to think about it, that at one point in, a, in the transaction between individuals and whatever that may look like, that men can be seen as subhuman just because they can't allow themselves or they aren't allowed by society, more or less, to receive compassion or feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a huge part of that, though, or a huge part of what happens is there's a lot of violence that is happening towards young people, towards children, right? And when you're young, you're impressionable and, and you're, you're learning how to define yourself or who you are and it's adolescence and there's hormones and there's all these things going on in your brain. Um, but kind of what happens if that's happening, but then like a violent act happens? I'm assuming you interact with a lot of young adults or that there are programs within CVTC for young adults and what that... Yeah, it's specifically in CVTC, uh, we don't get a, a lot of, of kids. In other places that I've worked, I've, I work sometimes predominantly with kids um, mm -hmm. and often with with, uh, with younger boys. You know, I... But I work with adults who have been kids when, right. who were kids when they when they were um, assaulted, um, be it sexual assault or other violent crimes. Most of the cr people that I work with have been sexually assaulted yeah. or abused um, over a long time, and so I think, you know, we try to make sense of the world. That's what we do in our minds, and especially when you're a kid, you try to make sense of the world, and and you're try to, to understand the world is rational. Right. Exactly. Us. Yeah. Like you try to understand how, like, and your mind will do everything that it can to make it rational in one way or another. Right. And so I th I think that the maybe the biggest experience that I see with younger folks who go through this experience um, of of crime or violence is that they internalize, meaning. You know, saying that my my environment, that my parent, that my caretaker is not safe, kind of you know tears my whole world apart. So if I say that I deserved it, if I say that it is my fault and mm -hmm. and I am to blame, then it's problem solved, right? It's a really s simple solution, and it's then. Deep. I know. Oh, it makes so much sense, and it's so sad. It's crazy, right? It, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you when you think about these kids, uh, yeah, it's it's profoundly sad, um, and it makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, we do it as adults as well, but we have more resources, um, and we're not often as dependent as as we are as kids on our caretakers. Um, so, following the Brock Turner case, which is the whole reason why we started this whole thing. I mean, not the reason, but it was one of the sparks. Um, there was an article, because uh, the woman who was raped by Brock Turner published this letter, right? And then somebody came, one of the people who responded to it was this woman who talked about how, you know, she wrote this whole thing about how it's really tough to, because she had been raped by her brother-in-law, and 
how the women who love them don't want to see pe- perpetrators go to jail. What I'm trying to say is that I understand where you're, what you're saying and that I, in some way, have almost experienced it slightly myself, mm-hmm. even if I haven't gone through that, like, that deep of trauma. Yeah, yeah. of course. I mean, it, it, it's, again, if we're talking about denial or if we're talking about this experience of, like, it's no big deal um, or, or I shouldn't have mm-hmm. one, two, three... Um, it, yeah, it, it makes sense. Sometimes it's and it's OK that it stays in that realm. If if there wasn't, an, a, you know, a ton of harm done and it actually makes life easier to sort of stay with that understanding, then, then great. But if but if there's suffering, yeah. right, then that's where where people should seek help. Yeah. I mean, we've been talking about violence and we just kind of started touching on sexual violence. And so I wonder if you can kind of address that piece of it and you yeah. know men surviving that and yeah, yeah let's let's first say loud and clear um and sort of directly that men are often survivors of of sexual assault definitely in their childhood and and later on in adulthood mm-hmm. um it happens unfortunately all the time we don't hear about it as much um there is much more taboo about approaching it or about men coming and talking about it but it happens all the time um and it needs to be said because not many say it um yeah we i mean we closet the hell out of it we mm-hmm. throw it in the closet and like you said it's taboo and i just i don't know i, I keep getting emotional like my heart breaks for like yeah. men who go through this and it like, it's real it happens on the regular and it's yeah. just not allowed to be talked about and whether that's a faultiness in masculinity or whether that's a faulty in our society that is a problem mm-hmm. yeah it it's is happening consistently and constantly and there's mm. no it, or at least it seems in the public sector there's no education or space for that conversation and and again maybe it goes back to vulnerability and allowing men to feel vulnerable and feel compassion but there's no room for that, it feels like. Yeah. There's very little room. There's very little services, as, as I said a couple times already. Um, and, I mean, statistics say that one out of six children, uh, uh, six boys, is, is um, molested or sexually abused or assaulted throughout his, their childhood. Yeah, one out, one out of one six. One in six? One in six. Yeah, the, there's an organization also called One in Six, and it's a great resource for, um, for survivors and, and people who want to support them. Uh, one in six, yeah. Damn, that's everybody under 18? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. That's just as much as women. I, th- I think it's, it's one a. In five for women, isn't it? I think it's one in five. In five, I don't know. I think it's a. L- be- I think it's like a tiny bit less, but I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm I don't know the statistics. Um, for women. Um, yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens a lot. We. And there aren't a lot of services, and there is a taboo about speaking about it and and coming to get the help. Um, and I think we need to raise the the awareness that there are services out there, and that it, also that there is help out there, not just services, but there's help. And and uh, you know, saying it this after working uh, or while working at, at the Crime Victims Treatment Center, um, and this might sound cheesy, but it's also the truth. So the truth is that we 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 heal trauma, um, and trauma is one of those. Um, experiences emotional experiences uh that really has there's a lot of hope um for someone who's gone through uh through something traumatic um that's great i mean that's that i think that's it's, good to hear. I mean, hope is <laughs> it's a good word to hear at this moment right mm-hmm. um and like being a victim of violent crime or survivor of it i'm assuming and assuming correctly uh, that it comes with a lot of baggage uh but being masculine, it's it's hard to associate with baggage or feel comfortable having baggage, uh, maybe even impossible. Uh, how do we, as a society, start the process of dis- destigmatizing victimhood? I think a lot of it is is sort of learning to re to redefine what masculinity is. Well, before we get there, so I have a question actually. Um, through talking to your your, the people that you're, you know, counseling, um, what is something that they have expressed, if anything, that they wish that they had had 
like growing up or what is what it, what did they crave that they didn't get uh that's an excellent question and i think is also in the base of what is what are solutions to to sort of redefining masculinity um and 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 helping men be more in touch with other ways of masculinity um support validation um safety creating having one person consistent in you know a child's life uh that is able to respond right we're all we have this incredible mechanism of attachment inside of us right where we attach we attach to whoever is caretaking um around us and it could be a secure attachment um if the caretaker is you know quote unquote good enough right um and is able to respond to us and it could be an insecure attachment or uh, an avoidant attachment or a uh, sort of a, a stressed attachment if the caretaker is not doing um what they need to be doing not taking care of us isn't consistent mm-hmm. um what can we do we can respond when something happens um we all have that instinct we all n- might know what is right to do right if someone comes to you if we imagine it someone comes to you and a child comes and says i am in trouble or something bad happened we all have an instinct of what would be the quote unquote right thing to do right mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. help them out ask them what what's wrong try to comfort them um uh try to um validate their feelings those those are sort of the things what often happens is that when when we know this is the instinct of what to do but when we are actually faced with it we find all kinds of reasons why not to do it mm-hmm. um right like it's not my place um <laughs> it's not i i can't really help um it's not my responsibility uh this is life i mean there's a lot of reasons that we can say um that we don't that we don't need to to help in this situation but if we if we do if we are able to respond then those small responses can make a huge difference for someone who is a victim of of tr- crime or is suffering from experiences of trauma Um. what you just said is beautiful and like one of the things that that comes up directly is like it almost seems like the context will have to change before people can actually feel comfortable speaking up like i'm not sure that i mean and this goes back to my nature my nature or my nurture over nature mm-hmm. you know which is that we have to cultivate an environment in which things like this can rise in, in, instead of expecting that people who live who are dealing with an extremely unwelcoming environment will come out and say what they have to say yeah you know and i mean i feel like it, i mean it really is up to us as a society um and as you know sisters lovers friends you know strangers whatever to step up Yeah. I think it's always a I mean a safe thing to do is to always be on the side of action with these things. Um if you think of saying something to protect someone or to um help someone out, um if you do it gently, you probably will not cause harm. Um I can't I I the amount of especially men who when when i have said to them after they disclosed something that happened to them i'm so sorry that this happened to you the amount of men who told me this is the first time anyone has ever said that they are sorry that this happened to me is it, it's unbelievable and it blows my mind every time because we're talking about men who are in their 30s 40s 50s 60s and 70s who have never been responded to even though they have disclosed the 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 sexual abuse um to other people no one ever said i'm so sorry that this happened to you um no and and, and that's crazy that's to me that's crazy right and that and crazy. and that response in childhood right if a child is hurt right and it doesn't have to be those words of course but like validation mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. seeing the other person for what happened to them 
Um, mm. we, you can't take away the pain from a survivor. That, that's not something that you can do. Um, but you can sit in the pain with them and you can validate that the pain is real um, and that something real happened to them. And, yeah. and that goes a really, really long way. And I'll say more, you know, also just connecting to services and and luckily there are a lot of services for for um, for victims of crimes um, and so so connecting to services is a really important thing uh, to do and and one of the things that uh, one of the the good laws that we have is the um, uh, what is VOCA, the Victim of Crime Act, um, which funnels money from um, criminals to services like our service, CVTC, oh. right, to sort of fund um, services for the survivors of the crime. Um, I know, right? It's like That's legislation that works <laughs> for the <laughs> people. <laughs> what? That sounds so fluid. I wow. know. What? That's Wow. Well, okay. that, that's part of how we're able to provide free services because mm-hmm. we get um, uh, uh, money from that fund. Um, so uh, there are other services around, and one of the things to look for wherever you are, and I, I get phone calls from different states often um, from people who were looking for services and sort of found services for men in New York because there aren't many, mm-hmm. um, but... Uh, one really good way to look for services is to look for victim services in wherever it is that you're living. Um, sort of, you know, look it up on the internet. Um, mm-hmm. And and victim services are often free of charge or uh, uh, very reduced charge because of this these funds that are available. Awesome. Um, and in New York, um, there's a lot of uh, agencies, really good agencies that, that provide trauma services. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, good. That's great. I guess to kind of piggyback off that is, you know, if, if we have people in our lives that um, who have been victims, I guess how do you empower men and boys specifically to be more open or to go searching out those? Because it says there's a lot of things, or there'd be a lot of uh, situations where people, again, would either be in denial or they just believe they don't deserve that kind of compassion or that kind of service. The only thing that I can say is talk about it. Um, Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. In terms of raising awareness, but also, uh, and this is a a very non-American thing to do, I'm learning, Um, (laughs) but but to be in other people's business, there's a there's very much a culture here. Oh, I think that's an Israeli thing, is that not? To be in other people's <laughs> business is, and in 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 in, Ameri- in America, you don't. And you step York, out, you're right? Like, you're like, mm-hmm. no, no. But but here, I mean, and I respect that. <laughs> I do. But also, if if you have someone in your life that's hurting, um, doesn't it make sense to say like? Hey man, you're hurting. Yeah. Like I, you know, yeah. I don't know what it is. You don't have to tell me, but but maybe look for help, or can I help you find empathy help? Or empathy and support is a good thing. Yeah. The, the what? I said empathy and support is a good thing. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, and again, in men, it doesn't really happen, um, it, or much harder mm-hmm. um, to find. So. Um, I'll say a little more about that because often survivors of crime, definitely someone who's been a, who's a survivor of, of sexual abuse as a child, right? There's secrecy involved, right? There's often like no one can know, mm-hmm. um, and and yeah. not just the shame aspect of it, but also the danger, right? Often the perpetrator will will you know as they're grooming a child for. The, the these horrible sexual acts, you know, it, it's it's going to be our secret. No one can know, and and um, and that stays, right? And so, yeah. undoing the secrecy is a really big part. Um, undoing the shame and the secrecy is a really big part of therapy for anybody who's been um, uh, a victim of childhood sexual abuse. And conversation is the way yeah. to undo it right the way to uh, to to undo shame is to sort of put it to light and mm-hmm. show the shame that it is unjustified yeah. um but that's i mean that's on on us and i'm pointing to myself as a as a therapeutic community right and and as a profession but it's not just right like we can all do this in yeah. our lives 
Wow, what a conversation. And um, obviously we can't change the way we see and interact with violence like today. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I'm happy that we had this conversation and, um, you know, we've spent our whole lives like learning the way we see it. And today we kind of had an opportunity to reimagine, to, e to reimagine it and to see what a world where people are kind to each other um, and, and provide a space for people to step up and say what has happened so that they can be free of that might look like. And so I thank you. Yeah, I think for enlightening us. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I've had in my head or that I think at least a culture society know but to actually talk about it and have this actual conversation and you bringing your experience and your knowledge to it really kind of affirm that and empowers us all. So thank you again, Yuval, for coming on the show. Um, uh, I'm so, so glad to have come. And I, I do want to say, you know, it's important for me to say at the end that if you are uh, a man or a woman, but we're dealing with masculinity, if you are a man who um, survived a violent crime, uh, childhood sexual abuse, um, anything um, like that, help us out there. Um, you can look up the Crime Victims Treatment Center and, and, and you know, come in for free services. Um, and there are other many services out there. And um, reaching out is sort of the first step um, and often is the hardest one. And after that, once you get connected, um, things become easier. Um, and it's important to keep hope. Uh, so uh, thank you all for listening. This has been Masculinity. I'm Samantha Nzessi. Tomorrow, George Philip first. <laughs> See you next time.